The Starship is well known as a fully reusable transportation vehicle that can be used for journeys to the Moon and Mars as well as Earth orbit. It's also known for being the world's largest rocket, featuring two stages, a super heavy booster and a Starship. During the flight of the Starship, the stages will have to come apart. And now, as the company's planning to fly the full stage of the prototype in a few weeks, many people are definitely wondering about how exactly the rocket's two-stage separation mechanism will function. So in today's episode of Alpha Tech, we're going to give you the most comprehensive overview and explanation of how this system works on Starship, and it's totally unlike any others. There are two distinct types of launch vehicle separation strategies and rockets. All require some kind of actuating latch or frangible bolts to attach and detach stages. The differences arise during stage separation. Some rockets, particularly Russian vehicles, rely on hot staging, in which a separating stage will ignite its engine slightly before or at the same time as it's released, blasting the stage below it. More commonly, rocket upper stages are jettisoned a significant difference from the lower before igniting and heading towards orbit with either small solid rocket motors or small vernier thrusters. However, SpaceX, by contrast, is heading toward spring-like mechanisms that can be tested on the ground and reused. Sidestepping decades of precedent, Musk says Starship will have no separation mechanism at all. This is the conclusion drawn just a month after SpaceX performed a partial test of these mechanisms that are used to attach the Starship and Super Heavy together and deploy the ship in flight. According to Musk, a separation mechanism was entirely superfluous and can be replaced by these existing systems. Specifically, Starship will conduct the separation stages based on the conservation of angular momentum. Right before the main engine cutoff, or MECO, Super Heavy will gimbal its engines, causing the vehicle to start rotating. By using the booster's gimbling Raptor engines to impart a small but significant rotation on the rocket just moments before separation, Super Heavy could effectively flick Starship away from it. This reaches two targets. It separates the stages while also initiating the booster's flip, which is required for the boost back burn. The whole process is a bit like how SpaceX currently deploys Starlink satellites from Falcon by spinning the upper stage end over end and letting the spacecraft just float away thanks to centripetal forces. Because Starship is five times heavier than Super Heavy at stage separation, the ship would effectively float away from the booster in a straight and stable line. Its propellant will be settled by coal gas thrusters, and six engines that ignite will propel it into orbit. In return for the slightly unorthodox deployment profile, if this new approach works, SpaceX can entirely preclude the development of a pusher spring system capable of pushing a pretty much 1,300-ton Starship away from Super Heavy. Now, that approach is possible on Starship in large part because of the ship's six Raptor engines that are completely tucked away inside a skirt, meaning that there's zero chance of nozzles being damaged by impacting the booster interstage. The next important question is after separating, how does Super Heavy land? When the upper stage separates in space, Super Heavy flips over while falling back towards Earth. As it descends, Super Heavy would deploy steel structures called grid fins shaped a bit like potato waffles from the sides of the booster. These will be equipped to help steer the rocket stage back towards its launch pad so it can be flown again. Previously, SpaceX had wanted to ignite Super Heavy's Raptor engines to guide it down to a precision landing on six steel legs, but this thinking has since changed. SpaceX now plans to catch the falling booster using an arm on the launch tower. They had successfully landed rockets vertically several times with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy boosters. However, the Starship, once stacked, is almost twice the size of a Falcon Heavy. Therefore, the forces that come to play are greater and will make a vertical landing more challenging. Musk said the platform and grid fins on the rocket are designed to take the stress. The SpaceX system will transfer final speed reduction and shock forces to the mass of the launch towers and robotic arms. Starship's first flight-worthy Super Heavy booster was outfitted with multi-ton car-sized fins similar to one in the original form of Starship that was first revealed in 2016. What was unexpected, however, was the fact that Booster 7's grid fins quite clearly had no retraction or deployment mechanism and were instead fixed in a deployed position after installation. 
By keeping the fins deployed at all times, SpaceX doesn't need to develop a complex retraction mechanism to maintain a mechanical linkage while still providing enough strength to push and drag several hundred ton rockets around at hypersonic speed. In addition, SpaceX has decided to remove the dedicated hot gas thrusters from Super Heavy. Instead, SpaceX will use the ullage gas from the tanks for altitude control by having four vents spaced 90 degrees apart. By venting the tanks through these vents, they'll be able to control the altitude of the booster during the flip. This has the advantage of using the ullage gas, which would need to be vented, well, either way, to do the useful work for the vehicle. Regardless, as we analyzed in the previous episode, there's many risks to this. Obviously, the separation of each portion of a multi-stage rocket introduces additional risk to the success of the launch mission. Reducing the number of separation events results in a reduction in complexity. So we have to wonder why do most rockets have multi-stage and a separation system when going to space? Well, the reason they're required is because of the limitation in the laws of physics, what it places on the maximum velocity achievable by a rocket of a given wet to dry mass ratio. The relation is given by the classical rocket equation. The symbol delta V is delta V of the vehicle. That's change of velocity plus losses due to the gravity and atmospheric drag. The MO is the initial total wet mass equal to final dry mass plus propellant. MF is the final dry mass after the propellant's expended. VE is the effective exhaust velocity determined by propellant, engine design, and throttle condition. And LN is the natural logarithm function, the delta V required to reach low Earth orbit, or the required velocity of a sufficiently heavy suborbital payload requires a wet to dry mass ratio larger than can be realistically achieved in a single rocket stage. The multi-stage rocket overcomes the limit by splitting the delta V into fractions. As each lower stage drops off, the succeeding stage fires, and the rest of the rocket is still traveling near the burnout speed. Each lower stage's dry mass includes the propellant in the upper stages, and each succeeding upper stage has reduced its dry mass by discarding the useless dry mass of the spent lower stage. A further advantage is that each stage can use a different type of rocket engine, each tuned for its particular operating conditions. Thus, the lower stage engines are designed for use at atmospheric pressure, while the upper stages can use engines suited to near vacuum conditions. Lower stages tend to require more structure than the upper as they need to bear their own weight plus that of the stages above them. Optimizing the structure of each stage decreases the weight of the total vehicle and provides a further advantage. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section down below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality video. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.